Well, in our sermon series on the Christian in every stage of life, we have come to time of parenting, if that could be called a stage. As I said, I had a little trouble getting a right title, overall title for this, but that phase of Christian life or that time for some, it's not something that everyone necessarily becomes a parent, but many do. And uh, so we've been looking, we looked at married people first, and then we started looking at the church's parents. And I showed you that the purpose of parenting, all parenting, whether parents realize it or not, is to bring forth godly children to fill the earth. That was God's original purpose at creation. He told them so, Adam and Eve, in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, They were made in his image, they were without sin, and they were to be fruitful and multiply themselves and fill the earth. People like them, made in God's image and without sin. And God instituted marriage at that time to be the soil out of which children would be not only conceived but also nourished, nurtured, brought up in godly ways as they would teach them, of course, the things that God had given Adam and Eve from the beginning, things like marriage, things like the Sabbath that he had appointed for them, labor and such things, and they would train up their children, you see, and then they would into godly adulthood. Sadly, Adam and Eve fell into sin and rebellion, Now they could only bring forth children that were corrupt, like they were. They were sentenced to die as being unfit to live on the earth. We saw how God really drove home that point when he wiped out the the inhabitants of the earth in the time of Noah. They were unfit to live on the earth in that corrupt, sinful condition, not what God wanted multiplied, not what was multiplied, not what we multiply by nature. That's not, he doesn't just want a lot of people. He wants godly people to fill the earth. And of course, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because God had promised that there would be a godly people by redemption, by his saving mercies. So the Lord was still committed to fill the earth with godly people. He promised Christ the Redeemer right in the beginning and forgiveness by blood sacrifices. He revealed to them sacrifices by the shedding of blood, the the, the remission of sins by the blood of the covenant. All through history, God has called out a people in Christ to be redeemed. He has promised that at the last day, He will raise them up, having perfected them in Christ. And what will they do? They will inherit the earth. We're told that Psalm 37, in the Sermon on the Mount, it's quoted by Jesus, will inherit the earth. Those not in Christ will be cast into the pit of hell with Satan. Then the earth will be filled with godly people. People who are only godly because of the work of Christ their Redeemer. All the praise and glory will go to Him. All our hope now is in him alone. We saw that there are two ways that Christ gathers people into his kingdom. By evangelism, where the church preaches to those who are outside the faith and calls them to come in and to receive the grace of God. The other way is by Christian parents, where the church's parents bring up their children in the Lord. Once he redeems us, he promises to bless us and our children if we keep his covenant, if we continue to rest in his promise. That means that redeemed people come not only through faithful preaching to the lost, but also through faithful parenting. In both cases, by grace alone, to those who preach, to those who parent, to those who hear and receive the gospel. Last week I spoke to you about how redeemed children are brought up in the soil of redeemed marriages. Of course, these children must continue in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
but we are to bring them up as a part of the visible church that looks to the promises of God, the church that looks to the promises of God for our children. There will always be those in the church, like Judas, like the apostates that that John talks about in his epistle that went out from us because they were never really of us. They were outwardly so, but not really. But we have the privilege of bringing our children up in the Lord all the while, looking to his spirit to work in them in the same way he works in us. So today, we want to look at God's calling to Christian parents. So please turn to Ephesians 6. Our text is Ephesians 6, 4. But I'll begin with verse 1. So our text is just one verse, verse 4, but I'll, I'll begin at the beginning of the chapter and read up and to through verse 4. It's not a very long reading. But this is the word of God. So give careful attention to the words of God. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Quite a few weeks ago now, when we were coming through the different stages of Christian life, we, we looked at uh, infancy and then we looked at childhood. And when we looked at the calling of Christian children, it's a calling to obey their father and their mother in the Lord which is the subject of the first three verses. Okay, that was some weeks ago that we looked at that. You can see the promise to them that's here that if they do, they will live long on the earth. And I want to say, indeed they will. Perhaps more than meets the eye. For these are children with Christian parents. Parents who will command them to follow the Lord Jesus and to believe on his name. If these children obey their parents in the thing that is most important to their parents and the calling that their parents give them in the Lord, they will inherit the earth forever. Like Abraham did. He didn't get hardly anything while he was here because he knew the, the inheritance was coming later. Not just for people that lived after him, but for him and the people that lived after him. When Jesus returns and raises us from the dead, just as he promised so long ago, so he promises today. The children need to do like Timothy then and continue in the things that they were taught from their childhood. And if they do, they will be resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will know the blessing of God. They will inherit the earth. But with verse 4, we look at the other side of the relationship. At the Christian parents who are to be obeyed in this relationship. This is what I want to focus on today. We laid some foundation last week, but verse four, again, I'll just read it again. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You notice, of course, that the fathers are the ones who are addressed. This is not because mothers don't matter. We talked about that very much when we looked at marriage, how the mother is the one who is the fruitful vine in the household. But it's because God has made fathers responsible for this discipline and training of children in the home, as the head of the home. Mothers are responsible, as we saw when we looked at marriage, to join with their husbands, to conform their ways and themselves to their husbands as they are following Christ and then work together as one with them. And the husband, of course, is to, to love his wife as he loves himself and to, to sacrifice for her. So one part of that conforming that she does to her husband certainly involves conforming to her husband as he leads the way in bringing up their children in the training and admonition of the Lord. So let's consider what fathers are to do with mothers helping fathers to do this. First of all, you need to bring your children up in their true identity. 
Now, I, I use this language, of course, for a reason. Because it's something that's talked about so much in our society. I hardly need to tell you how confused people are in our society about identity. Our society is so confused, in fact, that we are at war with our own bodies. It's like Kierkegaard on steroids. He is the one who first accepted the notion that our faith, what we believe, can be divorced from the real world. With this method, you could trust in Jesus as an idea, even though you don't believe that he was actually born of a virgin or raised from the dead. And churches, even Presbyterian churches, started accepting ministers and ordaining them that didn't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin or that he was raised from the dead because they believed in the things that were higher than that, the ideals that came from the narrative and the story that were divorced from the historical reality of these things. It was a way of divorcing faith from history. And it's had tremendous impact. What the church does impacts the whole society in which the church is. It made faith a personal matter rather than an absolute truth claim. It's something that works for you, but someone else can have something else entirely different that works for them. And that doesn't matter because that's up here in this realm of ideals, and you're living down here every day, going to work and doing all the things you do. So it, in the end, it really doesn't matter, in this way of looking at things, if Jesus actually lived or not. Uh, people, can, people can trust him in the way that they want to trust him and draw from his, uh, the, the, the motivations that they get from his stories or even reading the Gospels. But it's just your belief, and it doesn't really matter whether it actually happened or not. Well, now people have taken this notion so far that they not only divorce themselves from history, but they divorce themselves from their own bodies. We saw this going on, celebrated in our city in the past week. A man can come to believe that he is a woman even though he has a man's body. Because up here in the realm of faith and ideals is where, he's, where, where, where real, one reality is and down here biologically is something else. His body does not matter because it's thought the real person is what he thinks and has nothing to do with his body. Christian professor Nancy Piercy notes that a Princeton professor who gives a philosophical defense of transgenderism admits that it involves disconnect, disjunction, self-alienation, and self-estrangement. In other words, you're at war with yourself. You do not accept your body. You divorce your mind and your faith from your own body. At the root of our confusion What's at the root of this goes all the way back is our refusal to recognize God's authority. In the context of upper story faith, that, that upper realm, people might speak of the image of God or of Jesus being very important to them. But then when it comes to deciding what to believe about Jesus or deciding how we should live, then it doesn't really matter what it says in God's word because I can cast on this Jesus that I believe in my own head whatever I want to cast upon him. Then I can have whatever commandments I want, whatever things I want to believe. Simply attribute them to Jesus. He can be the one that frees me from oppression as, uh, as one who wants to live in rebellion against God. The Lord tells us that we are fallen in Adam. He tells, that's what we are. He tells us that we were made in God's image. That's the truth about us. That we are now his image corrupted by sin. Since most people in the church don't like that, I'm talking about the whole church made up of many that don't really believe, so they don't like that, they simply reject it and come up with a different narrative 
this more appealing to them. The result is that there is an identity crisis. We do not accept true identity, fallen creatures who are made in God's image. We refuse to accept that true identity. It doesn't matter what is true. It only matters what we want. Now, you see, the fact is that that's precisely what the fall was about. Exactly what the fall was about. Satan told our first parents, if, if you reject God, you can take God's place. Now you'll be the one who decides your own reality. God created reality. Now you can create reality for yourself. They could live in their own reality instead of living in God's. It doesn't matter what is true. All that matters is what you want. What you deem to be good is good, and what you deem to be bad is bad. True becomes what is desirable to me, true to myself, and not true in an absolute sense. That's the foundation of the confusion, of our confusion today about our identity. So we need to look at what is true. We need to, rather than just what we want to believe. And that brings us to our text. God tells Christian fathers to bring up their children with a Christian identity. Christian fathers are to bring their children up with a Christian identity rather than some alternate identity. He says right here in our text, fathers bring, up, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. They're to be brought up as those who belong to Jesus our Redeemer. It's under his training, his admonition is their Lord who, promise, who makes promises to them. That's their identity. That's their God-given identity in this world. I am God to you, he says, and to your children. Bring them up in that identity that God has given them. The Heidelberg Catechism is splendid on this. The very first question is this. What is your only comfort in life and death? Answer, that I with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, Wherefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. The identity of us all as Christians and, as, and of our children is that we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And then question two gets at identity even more because it talks about what you need to know about yourself, who you are. And it says that you need to know these things if you are to be eternally happy. Question two, how many things are necessary for you to know that in this comfort you may live and die happily? That you in this comfort may live and die happily? Answer, three. The first, how great my sins and misery are. The second, how I am delivered from my sins and misery. The third, how I am to be thankful to God for such deliverance. This is an extremely difficult thing for our society to accept. How can you impose your beliefs on your children? They are your beliefs, but your children need to be sovereign to determine their own beliefs. Unless, of course... It is, talking about the world's view, unless, of course, it's the belief that everyone should decide what is true for them. They have to accept that. See, there's an inconsistency there. Everyone has to accept that whatever people believe is true for them. They have to, everybody has to accept that. But we don't want to impose anything. The belief itself is that you aren't supposed to impose anything, which is exactly what is being done. Imp imposition of a lie apart from our God-given identity that we are the ones who make up our own identity. That's the unbending truth that is established in the world today. But we must not hesitate 
on our part at all to tell our children what is true about them according to God. They are sinners who are destined for hell apart from Jesus Christ. It is only through faith in him who saves us that we can be blessed. That's the truth, whether anybody likes it or whether they don't. And we should show our gratitude by serving our Lord Jesus Christ all the days of our life, by resting in his salvation and walking with him. God says that he is the God of us and our children. He tells us to baptize them, to show that they are sinners who need to be washed in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit so they can live for God. In themselves, they are defiled and polluted. So at the door, they have to be washed to come into God's house. They are pardoned and righteous and sanctified through him. They have the spirit and the word at work in them so that they can believe the truth and obey God. They are sinners, and they have an, but yet they have an inheritance in God's house. And they are to live with joy in the hope of salvation. That is their identity as the children of a believing family. There are things in this that we do not like. That we are condemned sinners, but for God's mercy in Christ. That's one of the things that you always see shaken off in the church when it starts to go astray. You don't like that. But our not liking these things doesn't make them to be untrue. Still just as true as ever, whether we like them or not. And that, that's how a lot of people decide what they believe, isn't it? What do I like? That's what I'll believe. You don't believe what you like. You have to believe what is true. And, the, and then there are things that we do like. That Christ came and died to save us and that he has given us his spirit to work in us. But again, we don't make those things true by believing them. They're already true. It's just that they're, tr they're true because God is gracious. Not because we believe them. They're true whether we believe them or not. So children are to be brought up with this identity and they must accept this identity else they will be apostates who die in their sin without Jesus Christ. And that's not something that never happens. It does happen. So what a liberating thing though it is for our children to know who they are. To not be brought up in the confusion and the uncertainty of who in the world am I? I don't even know what gender I am anymore. God has told us who we are. He has given them the truth that is hidden from unbelievers. This is a marvelous thing. They will not be left to divorce themselves from history and from reality. Anyone who tries to make up their own reality is going to crash hard against God on the day of judgment. Because that's when the light is going to be brought forth as it's never been brought forth before and judgment will come forth. Then they will see that they do not have the power or the authority to play God and to establish their own identity. That belongs to the Lord God of glory who created things the way he created them without consulting us. We do not have the power to create, but are meant rather to live in God's creation. Now let's look at the means that fathers are to use to bring their children up with this identity according to Ephesians 6.4. There are two components to child rearing that are mentioned here, training and admonition. Let's look at each. Training is from the Greek word paideia. This is a very comprehensive word. The overall meaning as it's translated in the New King James is training. It involves putting someone to work for a purpose, you might say. When you train someone, you put them to work for a purpose, such as training someone to be a swimmer or training them to, be, to play the clarinet. Training involves many things. You have to show them how to do it. You have to get them to practice. You have to show them when they go wrong, set them back right. You have to prepare them for events like a meet or a, a recital. You have to encourage them and spur them on. You have to give them hope. Yet very often it involves leading by example, showing them what to do or teaching them to follow the example of others. Now, how do you teach someone to carve wood if you don't show them or show them, point them to someone who is able to do it. 
inherent in this particular word is also the idea very much of chastisement, corrective discipline. Pedia is translated by the word chastisement in the New King James uh, in Hebrews 12. You might want to flip over there for just a minute and we can get an idea of what chastisement involves. We begin with Hebrews 12, 5. It says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Okay, that's that same word, pedia. The chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, there it is again, and scourges every son whom he receives. Now you can see that it's associated definitely with correction. It's associated with both rebuke and scourging, which involves the infliction of pain. It involves pain. We are stubborn in our sins. And sometimes pain is required to bring us to repentance. And God loves us. He doesn't hesitate to use pain when it is needed. Sometimes pain is also needed to build muscle. Not so much because we went wrong, but because we have to build muscle and get stronger. As with the training of an athlete, he has to work harder than a slave does if he's going to succeed in his sport. He does work harder than a slave does. He, he's not beaten with a whip. He's driven by the desire to train for that goal that he has. Sometimes it's very painful. It was painful for David when he committed adultery and tried to cover it up with murder. And he ended up experiencing the destruction of his whole household as God's chastening for what David had done. God told him that that was what would happen to his household. He told him that one of his sons would sleep with his wives in defiance of him as taking his place in rebellion. One of his sons raped his half-sister. And another of his sons did this defiance. Another one tried to take his kingdom. The passage, it was, it was painful. Painful, painful for David. But it was needed for David. David tells us that it was needed. He tells us that it accomplished good in his life. The passage continues, verse 7. If you endure chastening, there's the word chastening again, God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Chastisement is a good thing. It shows that we are God's sons and that he cares about us. It shows that we're our father's sons and that our fathers care about us. If someone in the church can live in rebellion against God and not receive chastisement, it shows that they're not really a true son. God chastens those that he loves, scourges every son that he receives. If he were, God, God will chasten us to correct us. The worst thing of all is to be left without chastisement. Do you know that's what keeps us? Read the Old Testament. Israel was exactly like all the other nations. But for one thing. God kept chastening them. He kept sending prophets to call them back. They were always ready to go off and worship Baal or ready to go off in their immorality. They were just like everybody else. God said they were just like everybody else. But what made them different was that God kept coming to them. He kept raising up prophets and sending them again and again and again. He brought trouble to them. He brought nations against them. He brought them into bondage. He kept calling them back, calling them back, calling them back. And all through the way, by His grace, He preserved a remnant according to His election that continued in His ways all through the years until the promised Messiah came. And then God began to do that in the whole world as He began to call the nations out to Jesus Christ, and he preserves them in the same way. We go astray. He preserves us individually. If we go astray, if God does not keep his hand upon us, the worst thing of all, someone can profess their faith in an artificial way, and then they, they start rebelling against God, and nothing happens. And they're not sons. God chastens those that he loves. 
Now, we can't always, of course, make a, a specific judgment because God works in marvelous ways. Sometimes his, he delays his judgment for a long time on one who really is his son. I'm not trying to make wooden judgments here. But the principle is that God scourges his sons. If he doesn't, they're not sons. So Padilla includes training as well as chastisement in a corrective way. Full training with a special note, too, on correction. Because we're sinners. The second word is admonition. Now that word literally means to put to mind. Uh, you know, no, you, you have a, the idea of a, the mind. Uh, we, are too e we too easily live our lives without really thinking about what we need to think about. We don't think about what we're doing. We're just doing. We can drift along, you know, just from day to day, from one thing to another, go to work, entertain yourself, just living from day to day without thinking much about God or His calling. Living the Christian life needs to be deliberate and intentional. We need to be reminded about what we should believe and about how we should live and about the importance of trusting God and serving Him. We need to be admonished to pray and to read the Word and also to obey the Word. Admonition in includes a father leading his family in family worship. Getting out, script, getting out the scriptures and not only reading the scriptures, but admonishing his wife and children from the scriptures. See, they're supposed to admonish. You don't, some people say, oh, we just let the Holy Spirit do that. Well, why don't you do what God told you to do, what the Holy Spirit told you to do, which is to admonish your children and look to the Holy Spirit to use that to work in your children. It's not either you do it or the Holy Spirit does it. It's that the Holy Spirit does it through us as we use the means that He's given us. It's God's blessing. So putting them in mind of what they need to be living for it needs to happen every day. Comforting them in the promises of God in the hope of Christ's return. We lose sight of it. Remember how we saw in Genesis 18, 19 that God chose Abraham to command his household to keep the way of the Lord so that the Lord might bring his blessing upon them, what he had spoken to him? It would involve, this admonition also involves keeping your children in mind that God is at work in us to see his grace and to look to him to help us when we're weak and when we're struggling. That we ought to seek Him and pray for His daily help in our time of need, for His protection and His provision. To remember that when we have sinned, that we have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous who shed His blood for us, that there is forgiveness so that we can be pardoned and we can go forward. To remember that when trouble comes, that God has sent it and He will use it in our lives if we look to Him. Like Padilla there is also a corrective element that is very strong in admonition. It involves confronting our children about specific things, calling them to repentance for specific sins, calling them to take up particular duties that they have neglected, such as helping their mother bring in the groceries, something that's very mundane, yet very important getting on with the yard work that they were given responsibility to do, whatever. All in all, admonition is keeping your children in the fear of God, to remember their creator in the days of their youth. <laughs> Thinking about Ecclesiastes again. His promises, God's promises, God's calling, God's commandments, God's judgment, God's grace. Admonish them. Put them to mind about all of those things. That's what elders are to do too. They admonish those that are under their care. Fathers, admonish your household. This is your duty. Now there are some important things for fathers to remember with both training and admonition. First, it is important to keep the goal in mind when you train and admonish. Now I've mentioned this along the way, but I really want to drive it home as a separate point here. The goal of parenting is the bringing forth of godly children as we've seen. It is receiving the promise 
of sanctification unto holiness. It is receiving the inheritance that Christ has given us in Christ. It is that God has given us in Christ. It is growing in our knowledge of the Lord and in our love for Him. When the goal is kept in mind, it changes the way you do things. When you train and admonish without the goal, the hard things of training and admonition are just painful. I mean, that's all they are. They're just a pain. It's just hard stuff. And you, you got no use for it. But when you have the goal of holiness, hardship is transformed into grace that helps you. That's why Christians can rejoice in tribulation. Because the hardship and the discipline and the correction and all these things come to us to help us reach the goal that we want to reach. Just like the athlete. You know, if you're, if you're an athlete, if you want to be in the Olympics, you don't go and find some guy that's going to be really easy on you to be your trainer. You want somebody that's going to drive hard. Because if you don't have somebody like that, you're not going to attain the goal. You want to be... You want to be dealt with. There's no goal. There's no goal. And why, why do I want to do these exercises? It's just it's a pain. I want to go and play. I don't want to do this stuff. I don't want to study. Because there's no goal. You see? If you have your children spending time in prayer and Bible study just as a raw duty. Did you study your Bible? Did you do your prayer? Just a duty. And there's no purpose in it. You know, they're not looking to grow and to put on the, the fullness of Christ and to grow in love for Him. It's just, it's just a stupid duty. And as soon as they get away from you, they're going to be done with the duty. Because it was just a, a raw form. Unless they maybe still feel guilty about it and go through the motions anyway. Oh, I did it. You know, and then they're done and they go away. I read, read my Bible. Great. Okay, hey, it's just, you, you understand the concept. You, you, you do well to keep the goal before yourself and your children. It will change the attitude, theirs as well as yours, about things like chastisement. You know, I, used to, uh, I used to do this with my children when they were very little. When they had a sour face, I would say something like, do you want to go through the whole day with that? Sour face. And I'll kind of, kind of make the face back at him. You know, then you know, make face and say, that, that'd be terrible. Can you imagine spending the whole day like that? Oh, that'd, be, that'd be terrible. Why don't we ask God to help? You see, there's a goal there. We're not just going to pray, and there we did our duty, but we want a goal. We want to we be changed so that we can serve God that day. God appointed you to, be, to, to, to do this. What? A second thing to remember is that bringing up your children in the training and admonition of the Lord is both passive and active. By active, I mean that you are there, there is training and admonition that you fathers administer by your own hand or by your own mouth. In other words, you're the agent that's doing the admonishing or that's doing the chastisement. Your, your child needs to be chastened. You're the agent of the Lord who actually inflicts the pain on the backside of your disobedient child. And you are the one who speaks to him about his neglected duties and who admonishes him to get on with it. You're to be the active agent who carries out those things. God appointed you to be the active agent. and You're to be consistent because you're his agent. Now, by passive, I mean that you help your son or daughter to receive the training and admonition of the Lord that comes from other agencies, not your own. For example, your son is neglecting his responsibilities because he's spending too much time on his computer, and his computer crashes. You didn't break his computer. It crashed in God's providence. He doesn't have enough money to replace it. You didn't crash the computer or take it away, but as a father... You are to bring him up in the discipline of the Lord. You come and talk to him about it. Why do you think this happened? You know, what can you learn from this? How is it good that you don't have a computer for a while? 
I'm not trying to read exactly God's intentions, but sometimes it's pretty obvious. We help our children in those ways. To use another example, your children receive admonition that does not come from you many times. For instance, uh, doesn't come from your mouth at church. The Lord admonishes you through the preaching of the word and your children. We're there with our children receiving the admonition and the spirit is working in us and in them. We need then to teach them the importance of responding to the word that is preached, of being attentive to it, of applying it, of welcoming it. You should show them eagerness to receive the word. Parents who skip church for no good reason are a terrible example to their children. Satan is always trying to hinder us from hearing God's word, trying to keep ministers of the word and, and hearers of the word apart from each other. So don't, don't tell them it's important if you don't make it a priority in your own life. It's not going to go very far. Okay, so you see the difference then of training and admonishing in an active way where you're the one admonishing and in a passive way where you're leading them to training them to receive that which comes from the Lord in other ways. Okay, so both of these are part of bringing them up in the training and admonition of the Lord, that which he does without us and that which we're called to do is our duty. A third thing to remember is that the training and admonition you are to bring them up in is indeed that of the Lord. Very, very important. You're acting as his agent. This is a game changer for parents. You realize that you're acting for the Lord, representing him to your children. You are not acting for yourself, but as his loyal servant. There's a great temptation that comes with authority. The temptation is to use the power that you have over others in a selfish way. Almost everyone does that. Every parent, Christian or not, has God-given authority. It's supposed to be used to enforce God's commandments. God's punishment is the punishment that's supposed to be employed as his agent. But too often, parents in their selfishness have a bad day and then they take it out on their children. They rebuke them. They yell at them just because they're irritated and because they're not interested in helping their kids to be godly. That's why on Monday, had a really bad day and you're sitting in the recliner in your easy chair and a kid comes by and bumps the arm of the chair and you jump all over him. And then on Thursday, He's screaming at his mother in disobedient defiance, and you don't do anything because you're happy you got a raise that day. That's about you. That's not about God. That's about you. You're supposed to be God's agent, and you're abusing the authority that he has given you. You have no right to do that. God gave it to exercise for him. Forgetting that you're the Lord's agent puts you in a place where you will do what this passage verse says not to do. Provoke your children to wrath. Provoke your children to anger. The inconsistency I just spoke about, that will provoke them. They will see that it's not about God, but it's about you, that you discipline them and, and, and admonish them. You're not training them up in the Lord, you're training them up in your own ways. What good is that? Long-term inconsistency is also a problem where you're on and off with your discipleship. You know, you, you've been neglecting. I talked about family worship today. So you've been neglecting family worship, but all of a sudden you decide we're going to do it again. Okay, everybody's got to drop everything. We're going to be back on to this. We're going to do it. And you're on for another week or two. And then you're done again. Don't be surprised when you try to pick it up again if your kids resist. Because they've gotten into new patterns. They said, okay, this is, we're not doing this. So they get into new, and then you're calling them out from the, and they're going, this isn't even going to last. So you just get into a routine, you know, and now you're calling them out of it. You can provoke them with hypocrisy. When your goal is to make a good impression on other Christians, don't expect your children to have much interest in playing your game. Your admonitions are not about the Lord. They're about you and how you look. You'll come off that way if you have secret sins in your life too. Your admonition and training will look like, it will lack sincerity and it will affect the 
quality of your admonition and your training. You think you're getting away with your, your porn habit or whatever it is, but you aren't. Even if you never get caught, it makes your training and admonition all wrong. It doesn't come off right because it's not about the Lord. It's about you. You can provoke them by harshness. That happens when you lose control of yourself and you start railing out of control. It's not the Lord then. It's your own chastisement. And the rod of anger will fall. The Bible fail, the Bible says. One of the reasons that the world is opposed to the use of the rod of correction is because that's all most people know of the rod of correction. It's when I've had it up to here and then I'm going to go and do some damage. Like, that's not what it's about. It's a corrective thing. It's a blessing that you're adorning your child with, with wisdom through, the, through, through corrective discipline. The world has never seen that. They don't know that. They don't know what it is to be the Lord's agent. They've only seen a parent losing control. And it's such an ugly thing with a poor, terrified child not knowing what's going to happen to them, what, why this is being done. Just somebody got irritated with me. It's not biblical ch chastisement. It's child abuse. You can provoke your children to wrath by leniency. And you say, whoa, whoa how, how is that? I can see being harsh, but how, did I get, how would they get angry if I'm too le lenient? Well, child has a conscience. When they do wrong and you don't correct them and lead them to repentance, you get all agitated inside, like you do. If you're a Christian, you do wrong, you're, you're all agitated. And they lose self-control. And then they're subject to temper tantrums, depression, whatever, all, all those kind of things. The happy Gentle, loving child is the one who is lovingly and promptly corrected by his father for his own good. He is corrected quickly with the rod of the Lord. He is firmly called upon to face his sin for what it is, to confess it to the Lord, to seek the forgiveness of the Lord, to be restored and to go forward with a new walk, renewed in Jesus Christ. You can provoke your child to wrath by failure to point them to Christ and give them hope in his grace. So easy to discourage them. We can just become a policeman you know, with all the laws and the rules and all these things. If you don't point them to the only one that can save them and transform them and make sure that they understand his forgiveness, you're setting them up for despair, discouragement, hopelessness. You can never, can never do what I have got to do. I can never do it. You can do it in Christ Jesus. You'll never be perfect in this life. You're forgiven and you're growing, and you will be perfect. You can provoke your children by failing to understand them. Training involves helping them learn to work through their struggles. And again, if you're just a rule enforcer, you're, not, you're, you're only doing part of what you're called to do. You're not teaching them to call on the Lord for help in their time of need. You see, a, a kid's all discouraged because of something happened in the playground, and then you're there, hey, pick up your face or whatever. And you don't go and find out what happened and help them work through what happened. You just want to do business and get on with things. You can provoke, we, we, can mention, we, we could mention negligence, favoritism, showing one another, legalism, many other things. But the point is, you're to be there for the Lord as his agent training and admonishing your children with his training and admonition all for God's glory and for the good of your child. You're helping them to reach the goal of godliness for the Lord, as we saw previously. That's when you're acting as a father ought to act, as a true helper of their faith, who they are in the Lord. Because it is the Lord's training and admonition, here's a good thing, you can count on him to help you. Tell me, if a man has a large estate and he has many servants and he sends those servants out to do parts of his work in various places, is he interested in helping them? Of course he is. How about the Most High God? He appoints us to disciple his children. Is he interested in helping us? Of course he is. Do you fail? Of course you do. Does he forgive you and restore you? Of course he does. That's why, what it's all about. We have a Savior. 
Jesus Christ, He redeemed us. He died on the cross. That's how committed He is to this thing. That's how committed He is to filling the earth with godly people. He gave His Son to die on the cross. His Son came and did die on the cross for our salvation so that the earth could be filled with godly people. And now He's using the preaching of the gospel and He's using the ministry of parents to their children to fill up the earth with godly people. And that's what we pray for. That's what we seek in the Lord. And that's what He promises to bring about. So fathers and mothers, the grand purpose of parenting is fruitfulness for God. To grow up godly children in your home. If you do not use the means that God has given you as a parent, you have no reason to think that you'll succeed. But if you, by His enablement, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord, you can expect a godly harvest. Brothers and sisters, pray for the parents of our church. Encourage the parents of our church. They have a great task, but there's a very great reward for that great task. Please stand and let's call on the name of the Lord. Gracious, merciful, heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the calling that we have in Christ Jesus. We praise you, Lord, that we have an identity as those who are in Christ. And that means so much. In Christ is our righteousness. In Christ is our sanctification. In Christ is our wisdom. He is the one who has become for us all that we need to come before you and to stand before you and to live in your house forever and ever. And I pray, O oh Lord, that as you have promised, that you would bless us and our children. Father, we pray that you would help us, O oh Lord, that we would be able to faithfully administer the means of grace that you have given to us. Father, we pray for the church of Jesus Christ at large, that you would help her to preach your word faithfully. We know, Lord, that, that unfaithful preaching hinders the spread of the gospel. Father, we also know that unfaithful parenting hinders the rise of godly children from, from Christian homes. We pray, O oh Lord, then, that you would be merciful to us and that you would help us, O oh Lord, that you would give us grace. We have not the strength or sufficiency within ourselves, but our sufficiency is in Christ alone. Father, we rest in him. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to delight in the forgiveness that we have in Christ. When we consider these things, we can see how we have all failed how we have come short. And yet, Lord, you have restored us. You have forgiven us. You have given us hope. We thank you, O oh Lord, and we pray that we would keep, on, keep our eyes upon Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we would look to that final day when he will appear and we will be with him in glory. And we and our children will have the inheritance that you have promised to us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the blessings that you have given us. Bless us now as we come to the Lord's table, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.